like you to turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 12, with me tonight, please, for just a few minutes in preparation for the Lord's Supper. Exodus, chapter number 12, in verse 1. I'd like you to listen carefully and solemnly to what I have to say tonight. Of all the services that the Church of God has, this is the most solemn. You should be very careful and inspect yourself tonight as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper. I'll give you the background of it and exactly what it means. Let's go to the history of it. 3,500 years ago, what you are reading took place approximately 1500 B.C. In verse number 1 of Exodus chapter 12, it says, The Lord spake to Moses and Aaron the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months, to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, The tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, According to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. The house will be too little for the lamb. Let him and his neighbor next to him, his house, take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take the blood, strike it on the two side posts, and on the upper door post of the houses, wherein they shall eat. And they shall eat the flesh in the night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain till the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. Thus ye shall eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be for you a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I see the blood. You can't help but notice that the lamb that is mentioned here is mentioned in the singular. He, him, his, the lamb. And yet you had hundreds of thousands of lambs sacrificed that night. But there's only one lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. These were all types of the lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one Savior of mankind, the Son of God, who died on the cross. I call your attention to verse number 12, where he said, Against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. Israel had been in captivity since 1900 B.C. 400 years they had been in Egyptian captivity. And now God was going to break the bonds, not only of Pharaoh, but he was going to break the bonds of the Egyptian gods. The Lord, in this case, in the book of Exodus chapter number 12, the Lord Jesus Christ is the type in the Lamb. And it was by the shedding of the Lamb's blood that the power was present to break the bonds of iniquity, the bonds of Pharaoh and the bonds of the gods of Egypt. Without the blood, there would be no power. Without the blood, there would be no deliverance. Without the blood, there would be no remission of sin. Without the blood, there would be no covenant. Without the blood, they would remain forever in bondage unto Egypt and to Pharaoh. Pharaoh was a god. In the eyes of the Egyptians, this man was recognized as a god. He was a sovereign. And so that night when the death angel moved through Egypt, he destroyed not only the firstborn of every household, whether he be Egyptian or Israelite, he destroyed the firstborn of the household of Pharaoh. He attacked the god of Egypt directly, face on, and destroyed him. The deliverance of, I of Israel was a deliverance that was miraculous. A deliverance that came from the hand of God and only him. Man was totally, Moses, Aaron, Joshua, any of those alive at that day were absolutely and completely inept to be able to deliver themselves from the bondage they were in. And remember, the greatest thing you can understand about the 12th chapter of Exodus is the fact that they were in bondage. These people were bound. They were locked in. They were kept in. Pharaoh was approached and said, let my people go. If Pharaoh had let the people go, this would not have been necessary. But since Pharaoh is a type of Satan, he would never let the people go. 
Satan will never turn a sinner loose. He will never free him. Satan will keep that sinner bound in the power of hell till he drags him down into the pit Amen. when he dies. Amen. Satan will never set you free. But the Bible says if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. Amen. This is a remarkable, marvelous thing because the blood that was shed became a token to them. It was something that from generation to generation to generation, they would tell their children how that it was blood. Blood, child. Blood, son. Blood, daughter. It was blood over the doorpost and lintel. And it was this blood that the death angel saw and delivered us that night. If the blood had not been there, we would have died. We would have perished. We would not have been delivered. We would have been rebels against the only way that God saw fit to deliver us. Mind you, killing the lamb wouldn't do the job. Eating the lamb wouldn't do the job. They had in, if, they had in, if they had done everything that they'd been instructed to do, but apply the blood, that one thing, if they had failed to do that, they would have died in Egypt and remained in bondage and died in enslavement. But it was because that they put the blood where it belonged and the death angel saw that blood that they were delivered from Egypt. I cannot emphasize that enough to you tonight. Amen. It is by the shedding of blood that your sins are washed away. And it is not just any blood, but it was with the precious blood of Christ Amen. as of a lamb without spot or blemish. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, is the anti-type of the type you have in Exodus chapter 12. The precious lamb of God. In verse number 13, he said, It shall be for you a token. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Passing means that they're still here. They're still present. They were still in Egypt, but they were free. They were still there in the land of bondage, but they were free men. The blood had been applied. He had passed over. It was simply a matter of them moving from one place to the next, but they were free men. I'm still in this earth, but I'm a free man. Amen. There's a vast difference between me and the fellow who's never been saved. He's still in bondage. He has never been set free. Oh, he means well. He wants to straighten his life up. He wants to change things. Occasionally, he'll weep over his sin. I can't help but be reminded of what I saw three days ago on TV when Susan Smith's testimony that she gave to that sheriff finally came out when she admitted to that sheriff of Union County, South Carolina, that she had killed her two boys. She, the sheriff said that she put her head in the lap of a female officer and for two solid hours, this girl wept bitter tears. For two solid hours, all of that came up and came out. She couldn't hold it in anymore. But did that save her? Did that make her right with God? Did that do anything to put her in a right relationship with the Lord? Someone in the world would say, well, she felt so much remorse for what she did. Well, maybe she did feel bad about it. I certainly hope she did. I hope enough humanity is left in her to really understand that her two little boys now are gone. They say that that as that car went under, that the one older boy looked around and looked out the window at his mama, and he was trying to reach his mother as that car went down into the water. And to my deathbed, I would never forget a scene like that. That face could never be wiped out of my mind. It would, I would never forget that, to see the little fellow's face as he went down into the water. And she turned away from that, and she walked away from that horrible scene that day. And then she wept for two solid hours into the lap of a female officer. But did that save her? Did that make her right with God? The Bible said the sorrow of this world worketh death. The only thing that can make you right with God is not sorrow for your sin. That's not it. Sorrow for your sin of refusing the only sin bearer there is. If you, are be, if you come to the point in your life where you say, Lord God, my sin has me bound. I am a slave. I've tried everything that I can try. I've turned over every leaf that can be turned over. I've done everything humanly possible. And I'm still in the same bondage that I've always been in. Nothing is better. I've spent everything on every physician there is in this world. I've come to the end of my way. There is no hope. No one has the answer. There is no answer. There is no peace. There is no hope. And you're the last hope there is. Lord God, can you do something for me? He delights in people like that. He delights in taking a sinner like that. He rejoices in one who comes to him in such a situation. If you ever one time find yourself at that place, you'll come to the Lamb, and you'll see the blood that you've never seen with the eyes here. You'll see that blood. For you'll cling to that blood 
That blood will become precious to you. Amen. That becomes the fundamental doctrine of what makes you born again, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. What does the blood mean? It means that he died a bloody death for you. He suffered on the cross for you. He shed his precious blood for you. He gave himself for you. And we're not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, received by vain tradition from our fathers, but with a precious blood of Christ. Amen. So they hovered 3,500 years, 3, years ago. They hovered in the corners in their homes. They stayed back behind the tables. They got away from the front door. They didn't want to stand up there arrogantly and, uh, and profess to be something they weren't. They were all, no doubt, fearful that night. And they could hear the cries of death on either side of them. They could feel the movement of death in front of them. They could smell death in the streets. Death was all around them. Death was killing them. Death had put its icy grip on Egypt. Death and the death shroud had settled on the land of Egypt. And every god, every human, every being, everything had come under the power of the one true almighty creator God, Jehovah God himself, Amen. who will come again as King of kings and Lord of lords. And they'll cry to the rocks and mountains, hide us from the face of the Lamb that sitteth upon the throne. Amen. When the day comes that he puts that icy hand of death again upon planet Earth, it'll be exactly like it was 3,500 years ago. The only thing that will spare anyone is the blood of the Lamb. 3,500 years ago, that death angel passed through Egypt that night. He did not look to, for an Egyptian home or an Israelite home. He did not look for any nation, national race, creed. He didn't look for anything but the blood. And when he saw the blood, he passed over that house, and they were spared. Firstborn, inside, they were spared, and they were freed. I'm glad for that tonight. But now that has been an institution in Judaism for 3,500 years. To this very day, the Jew recognizes the Passover. To this very day, he understands that that's a great part of his tradition and his relationship with God. But it's so empty. The Passover to the Jew today is such a meaningless thing. He has an egg that he places on the table. It's the afikaman. And that afikaman means till he comes. But you ask any Jew today what that really means, and he'll say, well, tradition, it's been handed down to us from generation after generation. Well, who's the he? Who's coming? Let me tell you who's coming. Till he comes, the Lord Jesus Christ. They set a place at the table, an empty seat. They're waiting for the visitor till he comes. He's already come, folks. I can tell you who he was. Amen. He was the son of the living God. This is why he gave us the Lord's Supper. Now we pass from the, trans from, now we transform from the, from the Passover into what we call the Lord's Supper. We have come now tonight to the point to where we're no longer looking to the back, to the past. Amen. We're looking to the future. Amen. This Lord's Supper is a unique thing. It not only says, remember me when you do this, but remember me when you do this till I come. You see, it is both a prophecy on one hand and remembrance on the other hand. Amen. That's a remarkable thing. Amen. And the Lord's Supper tonight is given to the church of God, not to the world. Amen. He's not concerned about the world taking it. As a matter of fact, the apostle says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, if you take it unworthily, you, drink, you eat and drink damnation to yourself. Amen. The world has no right to take this. They don't understand this. It's not part of their creed. It's not part of their practice. It's not part of them. It's for us. It's for us who gather around with him. Imagine now, 2,000 years ago. Imagine that you're lying in a room, an upper room, and you've gathered with the disciples, and there are 12 of you, and there the Son of God is in your midst. You've been with him now three and a half years. He's just about over, and you feel it. You know how near death is. You know, you've begun to sense, he can't make it long here. This man can't last long on earth. They won't accept him, and he can't go much longer. And then he looked at them and said, you see this bread? This is my body, which is broken for you. Broken? Yes, broken. Let me tell you something. When that woman brought that alabaster box of ointment, she broke it. And when she broke it, it released the fragrance into the air. If it hadn't been broken, it could not release the fragrance. Until God breaks your will, it'll never be worth a dime. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, thou wilt not despise. Till your heart is broken, it'll be no good. Get the heart broken and the will broken, and the rest of it will find its own course. Don't worry about it. We spend most of our times worrying with non-essentials when the main thing passes us by. 
The real issue in life and the real issue between you and God is whether you've been broken. Amen. Not him. You. This is my body which is broken for you. And then he said, this is my blood, the cup of the New Testament, the new covenant, the new covenant. What's the old covenant? The old covenant was ratified with blood, but it was the blood of bulls and goats. It was an old covenant that had to pass away, the writer of Hebrews says, for if that old covenant had been good enough, it should not have had to pass away, but it wasn't good enough, so we institute the new covenant. What is that new covenant? It is the covenant of the life, death, burial, and resurrection, the blood of Jesus Christ. God's Son, make no mistake about it, Amen. there are none better. Amen. That new covenant finishes it all. It's the greatest covenant. It's the culmination. It's the apex. It's the zenith. It's the high point. It's the mark of God and man where they come together in the new covenant. And there's nothing greater than that. And that new covenant is when the Lord Jesus Christ comes and shows his hands to the Jews. And they see him and say, yes, we crucified you in the house of your own friends. Amen. And they see those nail prints in his hands and accept him as their Lord and their Savior. But there's a New Testament. And the New Testament is for us Gentiles. We dirty dogs been grafted into the natural olive tree. Well, I'm a wild olive branch and I had no place there, but he brought me in. How did he get me in there? He got me in there with the New Testament. Amen. Which has all the benefit of the New Covenant. But he looked at his disciples and said, this is the New Testament in my blood, I lie. John's on one side of me. Here is Matthew. Here is Philip. Here's Bartholomew. Here we are, and there's Judas. And now we're about to partake of the grandest thing of three and one half years with him in his earthly life. We have come to the most solemn, wonderful moment. We are going to take of the body and blood of the Son of God. Hold on. One of us is a traitor. One of us is a liar. One of us is a thief. One of us is going to take him and sell him for 30 pieces of silver. One of us lying there that day is a devil from the beginning. And yet he said, this is my body which is broken for you. This blood I shed for you. Judas, here's the sop of each end. What's that for, preacher? Judas... I want to be your friend. Amen. Any book on Jewish tradition will tell you that when the Lord Jesus reached out that sock to Judas Iscariot, he was saying, Judas, you don't have to go the way you're going. You're making the choice. Judas, even now, I will be your friend. Right. Turned away. And read your Bible. He left and went out and sold him for 30 pieces of silver. Why did he do it, preacher? Because he was a thief. In plainer words, the Lord's Supper won't save you. The Lord's Supper is not salvation. I don't care what the Catholic says. <laughs> what saves you, preacher? Once again, a broken and contrite heart. Amen. Thou wilt not despise, O God. You believe that that blood that was put on the doorpost and little will keep the death angel away? Well, then do you believe the blood that was shed on the cross will keep the wrath of God away? Well, then appropriate that blood and say, Lord God, I cling to nothing but the cross of Christ. I believe in nothing but the shed blood of the Son of God. I turn to nothing but the death of my Lord Jesus Christ. I cling to him. I trust him. I obey him. I believe in him. And I ask him to save my soul. And I've never seen the blood but I know you see it, and I know it's on the mercy seat in glory, and I know that's the, I know that is the propitiation for my sins, Amen. and I know you're happy with it. I accept it. I accept it. And then when I sit down with him at that table, I will take it with the other ten. That makes eleven of us, and we'll be there when it's finished. Will you be in that number? Will you be in that number? Are you one of the eleven? Or are you one that got up and walked out? In every congregation, there's a Judas. In every church, there's a Judas. Whether he's a Methodist or a Baptist or a Presbyterian or a Lutheran or whatever he is, there's always a Judas. God help you. I'd like to reach out to you tonight if you're a Judas in here, and I'd like to say, you don't have to go that way. Like he did to Judas. I'd like to say, look, 
You don't have to do it. What do you do, preacher? Just get up and fall on your face. A broken and contrite spirit, oh God, that will not despise. And I give you that opportunity right now. Before we take the Lord's table, would you just say, oh God, oh God. I don't care what people think. I don't care how they feel. I don't care what they say. It's my soul, and I don't want to go to hell. Ask him to save you. Oh, did you hear? Did you hear Daniel this morning when he stood and he said, I don't worry anymore. So I preach you because I was sitting behind him that night in Charlotte when he shot up out of that seat. Like a bullet, he came up from there. Like he was reaching for the heavens, he came up from there. Why? Because he got a hold of something for the first time. And that good part can never be taken from him. And it wasn't religion he got. He got the Son of God. All that it means. Would you come tonight? Would you come tonight? Would you come? Bow your head. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the precious promise. If any man comes unto me, I will in no wise cast him out. Thank you, for Lord, so much for that. Our Father, I thank you so much. There's much that is very, very sovereign about your will and sovereign about the elect. But it's very clear that if any man comes unto you, you will in no wise cast them out. I'm so glad, Lord, that I can stand before people tonight and say, Come, come unto me, come, come. And know full well that that's not a vain call that you will answer if they come. In Jesus' name we pray, for his sake we ask it. Amen. While your head is bowed now, your head is bowed. Give one another an opportunity, a solemn time. Would any of you like to slip up out of your seat tonight and come down to the front and hear, bow down, and say, Oh God, oh God. Put that blood over my doorpost. Put it over my lintel. Cover my house with it. Wash my sins in your blood. Forgive me. Be merciful to me, a sinner. Anything that comes out of your heart when it's broken and contrite, and God will save your soul if you believe he's the Son of God, the virgin-born, blessed Son of God who died, was buried and rose again. Would you do it, anybody? Would you do it? Come on, come down here. Let's get down and pray right now. Let's pray. Let's get that settled. It's eating at you, mad at you, bothered you. You don't have peace. You still don't. Come on, come on. And let's get down and let's pray right now. And you can have peace like a river. Would you do it? Would anyone here tonight? like to meet with us in the altar and let's have an altar prayer born again Christians you just want to come and you want to get down and you want to pray and you want to say Lord God I want you to wash me in my conscience my soul my heart my feelings all of me wash it in the blood forgive me renew me restore me with me where you want me tonight Lord I'll be one of them I'll go ahead and take this Lord's Supper like the other disciples did in the honesty and integrity of my heart, if you'd like to gather with us. My gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I come tonight not on my merit, not because I'm a Baptist preacher, not because I'm standing in this pulpit, not because I've done or achieved anything. Our Heavenly Father, I count as the Apostle Paul all these things as done that I may win Christ. Our Father, I come before you tonight and I ask you to open up my heart and my soul. And I ask you, Lord God, to bring me before you. And our Father, tonight, prepare me. Heavenly Father, qualify me. Lord, use me for the glory of God. And our Father, tonight, I pray that this would be anew for me tonight to restore to me tonight, Heavenly Father, all the joy and the wonder and the gracious and greatness of being a Christian, of being a believer. And our Father, when we walk out of here tonight, we'll be, Lord, as if we were babes in Christ and all began anew. Lord, cleanse us. Our Father, if there's hidden sin 
in the hearts of any of these dear folk who gathered in this, in this congregation, in this altar tonight, if there are any hidden sins, make them known to them. Show them. Point, your, point it out to them. And then let them confess it freely to you. And then, Father, equip them to deal with the wicked one who's going to come and accuse them. Even though you've forgiven them, he comes back to accuse them. Our Father, give them spiritual discernment. Teach them how to deal with their adversary, the devil. Our Father, tonight, we know that taking the Lord's Supper does not save us. We know this, Lord. We know that this, this wine, this grape juice that represents the blood of Christ, we know it's not literally your blood. And we know that this wafer is not literally your body. But our Heavenly Father, it's not just wafer either. And it's not just grape juice either. We've come before you. And we've set this aside as a solemn time in your presence. When we reflect in our heart and in our soul who we are and what we believe. In Jesus' name we pray. And for his sake we ask it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. Blessed be his holy name. Amen. If you'd turn with me in your Bibles, please, the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 11. If you'd like to follow along with us tonight in Scriptures, we have the Lord's Supper. I'll say this before we take the Lord's Supper. This is the way we do it. Folks may do it differently. I know a pastor that does it all together different, probably than anything you've ever seen before. Don't worry so much about the form. The form may change. That's not the issue. Be concerned about the substance of what we're doing here tonight. This is what matters. This is what matters. This is a time to search your soul. The Apostle Paul says to the church at Corinth in verse 23, chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. <coughs> Brother Cox, would you please ask the blessing?